Hello, everybody. Welcome to lecture number 12. Today, we're going to be doing chapter 26, which is nutrition and metabolism. So nutrition is the starting point and the basis for all human form and function. All the source of fuel that provides us energy for all the biological processes and the biological work and the reactions that we need to carry out in our bodies is going to occur because of the our nutrition. Um, nutrition is the so source of raw materials for replacement of worn out biomolecules and cells. And metabolism is the chemical change that lies at the foundation of form and function. So metabolism is when uh, molecules can change from smaller things into bigger things or from bigger things into smaller things. It doesn't matter if it's one direction or the other, um, but metabolism is the chemical change of things, right? So when you have uh, amino acids turning into proteins, that's, a, that's part of your metabolism. When you have carbohydrates um, breaking down into glucose molecules, that's metabolism. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about um, the energy, the fuel, the ATP that we need to make our energy. So let's... Um, Let's talk about low body weight first. So body weight is determined by the body's energy balance. Weight is stable if energy intake equals the output. Okay, so if you intake as much energy as you put out, your weight will remain the same. You gain weight if your intake exceeds your output. Okay, so very simply said, and we, we do this, we calculate this intake, and we're going to see this uh, word a lot, we calculate this intake in calories, right? So if your intake in calories equals the output in energy, right? If calorie intake equals the output in energy, and when we talk about energy, we're talking about using those calories, right? So if you intake, you know, 2,000 calories and you use 2,000 calories, your weight remains stable. You gain weight when your intake, let's say it's 3,000 calories, is greater than the amount of energy that you're using during the day. So let's say that's 2,000 calories. That will result in a weight gain, right? Because you have a surplus, okay? You have a surplus of a thousand calories for that day. So, or, and then if you, if, let's say you, let's say you ate 3000 calories for an entire week and you only burned 2000 calories a day for an entire week, that turns into 7,000 calories for the week. If you do that times 52 weeks, that's a lot of calories that you are eating, but you're not using, right? You lose weight, and you guessed it, you lose weight when the output exceeds the intake, right? So if you eat 1,500 calories and you burn, or if you, you know, you could have made that 2,000, but let's say you intake 1,500, you're on a diet, right? So you're eating less uh, than what you normally would. So you're eating 1,500 calories and you burn 3,000 calories. Okay, that means you are negative 1,500 calories and if you do that for seven days, okay, 1,500 times seven, you can do the math, do that times 52. If you do that for a whole year, okay, your weight will reduce. It won't reduce till it goes to zero, okay? That's not how the body works. The body tends to have a, uh, a stable homeostatic point, okay? Now, I've seen this in myself, um, you might have seen this in yourself. Okay, when I was in my late twenties, early thirties, uh, I, I went on a I went on a little diet because I wasn't you know necessarily happy with where I was at, in my life at that point. But um, you know, I lost some weight. I lost about 25, 30 pounds, and my body stopped losing weight at around uh, you know one hundred and seventy five pounds, and I didn't change the way I was eating. Um, I didn't do less exercise once I got to that weight. It's not like I stopped, um, exercising or eating right. I continued to exercise and eat 
right the way I was for the entire time I was losing the weight, but my body didn't want to lose any more weight than this. Okay. My body kind of stayed at this point. My body liked being here. It didn't want to be any lighter. It didn't, you know, it didn't want to be heavier with the, with the nutrition I was intaking. Okay. Um, but that was, that was my homeostatic set point. That was the, that was the place my body was felt stable at. Uh, this is going to vary from person to person, right? Some people, um, there are different types of body types. There's mesomorphs and ectomorphs and endomorphs. And these are all different types of body types that we find in humans. Um, and everybody's going to be slightly different. So it's going to vary between person to person. Um, this ability to gain and lose and keep your weight stable is going to be a combination of things. Okay. Number one, it's going to be heredity, right? Um, if you come from a family, um, that tends to be lean and thin and athletic, then there's a good chance that you are going to be lean, thin, and athletic. Conversely, if you, uh, come from a family who's, you know, heavy or, you know, um, on the bigger side. Okay. Then you have a more likelihood of being that way as well, but there's also going to be environmental influences, right? Uh, the things you eat, things you, you intake, um, even though your family might be, you know, skinny people, full of skinny people, if you don't eat right uh, and you're constantly, you know, exceeding your output, exceeding the, the intake is exceeding your output, then you, you're, you're going to gain weight. About 30 to 50% of that variation in weight is going to come uh, from your genetics, okay, your ability to, um, uh, you know, metabolize things based on your, your genetics. Uh, environmental factors include eating as one thing. That's the most obvious one, how much you exercise. Okay. Or how much you don't exercise is going to be another environmental factor. Okay. And those things are going to affect your ability to gain or lose weight. Okay. Appetite. Okay. I've, control of weight involves several peptide hormones. Okay. And these hormones uh, are going to regulate they're regulatory pathways that control short-term and long-term appetites. Okay, so let's take a look at that a little bit. Okay, you have things called gut-brain peptides. Gut-brain peptides. These are two-way chemical signals between the gastrointestinal tract or the GI tract and the brain. Okay, so these are proteins that allow for um, communication between your stomach and intestines and your brain because that's what the GI gastrointestinal tract is, it's your stomach and intestines. Okay. So your stomach and your intestines can communicate with your brain through gut brain peptides. Okay. So first thing we want to take a look at is your short term regular regulators of appetite. Okay. Some short term regulators, um, the, the mechanisms work over periods uh, of minutes to hours. So these things work in very short amounts of time. Okay. Um, this gives you that feeling of being hungry so that you start eating. Okay. We've all been there, right? We've all had that, um, that sensation of, wow, all of a sudden I'm hungry. I need to eat something. Okay. And that's because of these short-term regulators, uh, telling your, um, it, it's a way of telling you, it's a way of your brain telling you that you're low on energy. You need to eat something. Um, so it makes you, it gives you this hungry feeling. But also these, these short term regulators are also going to tell you to stop eating. Okay. And the, when we're full, that's called satiated. Okay. That's the scientific term for I'm full. Okay. When you're satiated, okay. You feel uh, full. You don't want to, you don't feel the need to eat anymore. You might be able to continue eating, but you don't need to. And your body tells you, you don't need to. Okay. So when you're, when you're hungry, you feel it. And, you know, you want to get, you know, a sandwich or, or a bite to eat. And then once your body has the, the molecules it needs, okay, it, it makes that hungry feeling go away. And once that hungry feeling goes away, that's called sati satiation, okay? And that's when you should end your meal, okay? You should end your meal when you are satiated. Uh, many people, the issue with gain, uh, weight gain is that many, many, many people do not stop once they feel satiated. They continue to eat even past the point of satiation. Uh, and that, that leads to um, 
you know, an, an excess of intake and an excess of calories. Okay. Some short-term regulators include, okay, great. Oh, oops, sorry. Got to get my pen here. They include ghrelin. Okay, it's a polypeptide or peptide. Okay, the there's a peptide called YY. And coli stokinin. I'm, I'm going to mess that up every time I say it because I can never say it right. Okay, but ghrelin. Ghrelin is secreted from parietal cells in the fundus of the stomach. Okay, that's that upper portion of the stomach. It produces this sensation of hunger. Okay, it primes the body to take advantage of nutrients about to be absorbed. Okay, it wants us to be able to absorb as many nutrients as possible. And ghrelin is going to prime the body to do that. It's going to make sure that the, that the intestines know that uh, food's on its way so that it's going to have to absorb nutrients because that's where absorption occurs, right, in the small intestines. Okay, ghrelin secretion ceases within an hour of eating. Okay, so um, within an hour of you uh, eating, your, your body will stop producing ghrelin because it knows that you're done and it knows that the food's on its way already. Okay, peptide YY or PYY. Uh, secreted in the entero endocrine cells of the ileum and the colon, okay, uh, that can sense that food has arrived in the stomach. So once foods are once food gets into the stomach, the small intestines and large intestines um, know about that and they secrete this P PYY. The the more you eat the more of this is produced. And that's what this sentence refers to. Okay, secretion is uh, proportionate to calories consumed. So the more calories you eat, the more um, this peptide is secreted. Uh, the primary effect is to signal that you're full, right? That's that's what it means. So when, when food reaches your ileum and, and your colon, uh, your body tells you to stop eating and that you're satiated and it wants you to stop eating. So that's that's the whole purpose of P, uh, peptide YY. Peptide CCK, because I'm not even gonna attempt to say it, okay, is secreted by uh, the duodenum and the jejunum of the small intestine. Okay, this is the beginning of the small intestine. Okay, these are the first two parts. Okay, peptide YY is the last part of the small intestines and the large intestine, okay. Um, CCK, Stimulates secretion of bile and pancreatic enzymes. Okay, which makes sense because the uh, bile and the pancreatic enzymes enter um, the duodenum. Okay, they enter the duodenum with uh, the common bile duct. That's where that is, so that makes a lot of sense. Okay, it stimulates the brain and the vagus nerve. Okay, and it also is going to tell you to stop eating. Okay, it's another uh, signal pathway that tells you to stop eating, that you're satiated, that food has entered your lower intestinal tract, okay, so that you don't overeat. Okay, long-term regulators, okay, this is the opposite of short-term regulators. Okay, one long-term regulator that you have is called leptin. Okay, leptin is secreted by adipocytes. Adipocytes are lipid cells, cells that hold lipids. Okay, adipo means adipose and adipose is lipid. Lipid equals fat cells. Okay, so these are fat cells. Okay, so these are leptin is secreted by fat cells in the body. Uh, the level proportionate to one's own fat storage, so the more fat you have, the more leptin will be produced. The less fat you have, the less leptin you'll produce, and this informs the brain on how much body fat you have at any particular moment. It's going to stimulate uh, the sympathetic nervous system to secrete norepinephrine, which in turn stimulates the breakdown of fat. Okay, uh, and the breakdown of fat is called lipolysis. Okay, lipo means lipid, lysis means to break down. Okay, so leptin will tell the brain how much fat you have, uh, and it will stimulate the uh, the the hormone norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a hormone which in turn then stimulates the fat, the breakdown of fat. You might see norepinephrine in some supplements that help you burn fat, okay? A lot of times if you buy, go buy a fat burner um, type of 
thing from like GNC or some type of uh, vitamin shop, something like that, uh, they might have norepinephrine listed as one of the ingredients because norepinephrine is going to try to stimulate fat breakdown in the body. It typically does not work because these, a lot of times these chemicals in, in like these pill forms or these powder forms, your body doesn't react to them the same way as if it was naturally created in your body. Um, they're not as potent. They don't have the same chemical signaling capabilities. Uh, and a lot of times it doesn't, it just doesn't work. Okay. Um, eating right, exercising will produce the results you want. Okay. Stay away from supplements in, in vitamin shops and things like that. Okay. Most obese people have normal levels of leptin, but some have defective leptin receptors, which is going to, obviously, if you have, um, defective leptin receptors, you're going to stop the, the fat breakdown in the body, which is not going to help you get any thinner. Okay. Insulin, another long-term receptor. Okay. Insulin is secreted by the pancreas. It stimulates glucose and amino acid uptake, right? Cause that's what, a, that's what insulin does. It wants to take your blood sugar and it wants to reduce your blood sugar. Okay. It wants it, So if you eat something it doesn't really matter what it is. Most things have uh, carb carbohydrates and, and simple sugars in them. When you eat, your blood sugar spikes. You produce insulin, and that reduces your blood sugar back to normal. And the way what it does to reduce your blood sugar is it takes the glucose, and it gives it to your muscles. And your muscles make ATP, which is energy for your cells. That's that's how that's how that works. Okay. Um, has receptors in the brain and functions like leptin as an index of the body's fat storage. Okay. And, uh, weaker effect on appetite than leptin does. Okay. So leptin is going to have a much bigger impact on your appetite, but insulin will have more of an impact on your blood glucose or your glucose levels in your blood. Okay. Hunger. Okay. The actual feeling of hunger is stimulated partly by gastric peristalsis. Okay, um, peristalsis is that um, involuntary muscle movement of the digestive system. It's happening almost all the time. Uh, so when your system is empty, okay, this peristalsis will tell the brain that the, the system is empty and that you might um, need some food in it. Mild hunger contraction soon after the stomach is empty, right? So as soon as that stomach is emptied out, uh, mild hunger uh, contractions begin. Okay. The longer it goes without any food in it. Okay. The, the more intense those contractions get. Um, and that's when you start to feel hungry. Okay. So the increase in intensity over hours. Okay. Do not affect the amount of food consumed. Okay. So that basically means it, it doesn't, it doesn't change with the amount of food. Okay. Appetite is briefly satisfied by the following things, chewing and swallowing. Okay, so you, when you chew gum, you're kind of telling your body that you're eating. Your body doesn't know that you're not going to swallow the gum. Your body is anticipating you swallowing food when you chew. So when you, you, might, you might realize that when you chew gum, you end up getting hungry. And that's because your body is looking for food and it's never getting there. Right. So you're kind of tricking your body into thinking you're eating when you're actually not. Okay. Um, you satisfy your appetite if your stomach gets full, right? Filling of the stomach. That's a pretty obvious one. Um, long lasting satiation is going to depend upon the nutrients that enter your blood. Okay. So if, if the nutrients that you need are not being consumed in the meal that you're eating, then you're not going to feel satiated. Okay. You're not going to feel full because your body's not getting the nutrients it wants. Okay, so that's like um, if you're hungry and you eat celery or a salad, you might, and it depends on what you put on the salad, obviously, but if you eat, uh, you know, just like if you're trying to be good, quote unquote, you know, and you just get, you get some lettuce and, and some like low fat, like dressing or something like that and some cucumbers on your salad, you might not feel satiated for very long because there's hardly any nutrition in lettuce, right? There's, there's basically zero nutrition in lettuce. 
and the only nutrition you're going to get is from perhaps that that cucumber that's in the in the salad or maybe the the other carrots or whatever else you're putting in the salad um and i'm just talking like bare bone salad i'm not talking like grilled chicken or salmon or steak salads or anything like that i'm talking about just lettuce you know maybe one or two vegetables and and uh some some very light dressing okay uh that's not going to fill you up Okay, and it's not going to fill you up because you're not getting the nutrients. Even though you had, you know, half a head of lettuce and that's a lot of food and your stomach is filling up, that's why you feel satiated because basically your stomach's filling up. But as soon as that gets through your system, which is not going to be very long, your body's going to realize, wow, we ate, but we didn't get any nutrients that we needed. So I'm hungry again, right? Um, neurotransmitters, which are these, uh, and you probably learned about neurotransmitters in, a, in an earlier lesson. Um, or earlier semester with the nervous system. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that allow electrical impulses to jump from one neuron to another. Okay, these neurotransmitters stimulate the desire for different types of food, right? So there are some, um, there are some neurotransmitters that let you know what nutrients your body needs, right? Which is pretty cool, actually. You know, your body's telling you uh, what, what nutrients you need, what nutrients you don't need by producing different um, neurotransmitters. Okay, norepinephrine is one of those uh, neurotransmitters that's going to tell you that you need carbohydrates. Okay, you need carbs sometimes. Carbs are like little energy sources, and we're going to talk about individual uh, nutrients in a moment. Galanin tells you that you need fats in your diet. Endorphins tell you you need proteins in your diet. Okay, so different chemical pathways are going to tell you to eat different things. Okay, the term obesity is defined as having a body weight that is more than 20% above the recommended norm for one's age, sex, and height. Okay, 30% of the people in the United States are considered to be obese, where 35% of them are considered to be overweight. Okay, that's a lot of people that are over um, the recommended norm for age and sex and height. Okay. Now, the next thing, body mass index or BMI, is what health professionals use as an indication of being overweight or obese. And it's measured by doing the following. You take your weight in kilograms, you divide that by your height in meters squared. Now, and then you get some number, okay? And that number is going to be between certain numbers, right? And it, it on the BMI scale, if you get a number between 20 and 25, that is you are you are in your optimal weight range. Okay. If you are over 27, you are considered overweight. And if, if you are over 30, you're considered obese. The BMI scale was made, sorry about that. The BMI scale was made many, many years ago. And it was made in a time where most individuals, um, especially in America, were doing very, very hard, long hours of manual labor. And when you, and also people were not eating many, many years ago, people were not eating what we eat today, right? There, when, when the BMI was introduced, there was no fast food joints. There was no um, really deep frying things as heavily as we do today. I mean, I'm sure they fried stuff and pan fried things, but it wasn't nearly as much as we do today. So you got to remember that people, you know, hundred years ago were a lot leaner and thinner because they just weren't eating as, as unhealthily as we are. Right. Um, it was, it was like a treat to get meat for many families. Uh, you know, many years ago. Uh, so maybe they only had meat once or twice a week instead of, you know, we're eating meat two, three times a day, you know, four or five days a week if, if we're, you know, meat eaters. Um, some of us aren't. Okay, so you got to understand that many people that are not obese are considered obese on this chart. Um, you, you might have someone who's a, a fitness athlete, you know, a crossfitter or something like that who, you know, is it probably in their peak fitness of their life. Um, but because their weight and height match up 
over a number of 27, they would be considered to be overweight. So just just take the BMI index um, with a grain of salt, right? If you are if you are an athlete or if you are someone who um, is very active, the BMI not, might not be the best scale for you. But if you are a, you know a, a, a normal person with uh, normal activity, you know daily activities. Um, maybe the BMI would be a little bit more accurate for you, but you know, there are, there are people that are in extremely good shape who do not, um, would not benefit from using the BMI scale because it would just wouldn't be accurate for them. Okay. Uh, obesity is going to shorten your life expectancy because it will increase the risk of the following things. Arthrosclerosis, which is, um, plaque build up in your arteries. And when plaque builds up in your arteries, you can cause blockages. And when you cause blockages, you can have strokes and heart attacks, and things like that. Hypertension is high blood pressure, high blood pressure, high BP. Okay. BP. Okay. Uh, again, you know, high blood pressure leads to heart disease and things like that. Diabetes. Okay. Which is the inability to produce insulin to take glucose out of your blood. Uh, it can cause joint pain could cause kidney stones and gallstones, which are never, uh, never fun. And we, we looked at gallstones in the last lecture, I believe, uh, uterine cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Okay. And sleep apnea. Okay. When you're heavy, uh, and you're obese. Okay. A lot of times, um, your breathing is affected by that. Uh, and if you're, you know, uh, not breathing well while you're sleeping, that's called sleep apnea. Okay. It's when you you uh, momentarily stop breathing during your sleep. That's called sleep apnea. Not not very fun. Uh, the causes of obesity are fairly diverse. Okay, it's not just um, it's not just you know people overeating all the time. Okay, it's sometimes it, it, it has uh, some other causes. Uh, heredity is one of those causes, right? If you come from a family of heavy people, um, obesity might be a little bit more likely for you. It doesn't mean it has to happen. You, you do kind of control your, your fate, so to speak, but, um, it doesn't help. Okay. Overfeeding in infancy and childhood. So if you, if you overeat as a child, okay, that could lead to adulthood obesity. Uh, evolution resulted in adaptations to store nutrients to cope with times of scarcity. So what that means is, um, when we were evolving, you know, many, hundreds and thousands of years ago into homo sapiens we were hunters and foragers and we didn't know if we were going to have food every day so what your body has evolved to do is to store nutrients when because your body you know back when we were evolving your body didn't know that you were going to eat the next day and if you ate on Monday, okay, you might not eat again till Friday, right? And your body knew that because back in the day you had to hunt things and not every day you caught something or uh, not every day you were able to go out and, and try to get food. So your body knew that you might not eat for a couple of days. So when you ate on Monday, your body stored as many nutrients as possible to get you through till the next time you ate. Right. And that was an evolutionary adaptation. That's a good thing that we do that. Um, we don't necessarily take advantage of that. OK, you, you might hear things about intermittent fasting. OK, supposedly intermittent fasting is extremely healthy for you uh, and it'll help you lose weight. And that's when you, you know, you fast for a good portion of the day. You don't eat and you cause your body to you know, store nutrients and use nutrients that are in storage. Right. Um, and then that can keep your weight at a level, um, at normal levels. So if you're interested in that, check out intermittent fasting. Okay. Pharmaceutical companies are researching drugs that can act on appetite pathways to stop your appetite or, um, you know, make your appetite a little more manageable. Okay. Because the more calories you eat, the more calories your body is used to getting. So it, it's hard to, it's hard to change your habits, right? So you, you might be eating you know, way more calories than you're using. And you might say to yourself, well, it shouldn't be too hard to just eat the right amount of calories, but it's not like that. Your body gets used to eating a certain amount of calories and it wants that certain amount of calories all the time. 
And once you stop giving it that amount and you start giving it the proper amount, your body's like, where's the rest of it? And, and it, it kind of wants you to keep eating. Okay, here you can take a look at two uh, MRIs. One of someone who's uh, overweight and one who's um, of normal healthy weight. Not only is the size of the human being um, just you know double in size, but look at some of the organs. Okay, look at the look at the heart. Look at the size of the heart compared to the size of the heart on the other side. Look at the the all these like yellow areas. Okay, over here, over here, over here, especially in here in the intestinal tract. Okay, you see all these like whiter, yellowy areas. Okay, all this is fat. Okay, this is all lipid tissue, right? This is all adipose tissue. Okay, and you can see that the intestines and the liver are all covered in adipose tissue. The heart is covered in adipose tissue, okay, on the edges. Okay, and that's not good. You're you're putting strain on your organs when they're covered in this fat, this lipid, this adipose tissue, okay? Um, and it, it's going to cause these organs to have to work harder. And if organs have to work harder, okay, that means they have a better chance of failing, okay? And not, not functioning properly. Okay, so when, when, you know, people who are obese pass away and they, they, an autopsy is done on them, uh, we try to learn from that. And what we learn is a lot of people who are obese have hearts that are double the size of a normal person, of, of a person of normal weight. Their livers are double the size of a person with normal weight, okay? And that's because of the strain that they're under and, and, and the fat that's covering them is causing them to strain like that. Okay, so let's get into like the, that was just like a general overview of, of uh, nutrition. So let's get into like the science of it. Okay, let's get into like the actual biochemistry of it a little bit. Okay, so when you look on the back of a, a nutrition label, okay, it always has calories on it, right? And people count calories, and that's a good thing. You want to count calories because, like I said, you, you want to take in a certain amount and you want to use a certain amount. So one calorie in scientific language is the amount of heat required to raise temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So if you have one gram of water, which is not very much, and that gram of water is 30 degrees Celsius, and you wanna raise it to 31 degrees Celsius, you would need one calorie, all right? You would need one calorie to do that. If you wanted to raise it to 35, you would need five calories of energy, okay? If you wanted to raise it 100 degrees, you would need 100 to calories to do that okay 1000 calories is a kilocalorie okay a measure of the capacity um, to do work is what a calorie is okay it's a measure of capacity to do biological work carbohydrates and proteins will yield about four kilocalories per gram sugar and alcohol which we call empty calories okay they yield about 7.1 kilocalories per gram. They provide very few nutrients and they suppress appetite, but they're high in calories, right? So sugar and alcohol are high in calories, but they have no nutrients, okay, which is not good. We want something that's low in calories, okay, that produces lots of nutrients. And that's what good carbs like wheats, and things like that, and proteins are gonna yield. Fats, they give you the most calories, okay? Nine kilocalories per gram, okay? More than double carbohydrates and proteins, okay? Um, so they give us the most um, calories and again, less nutrition than carbs and proteins. They are needed though. You definitely need fats and we'll talk about that as well. Okay, good, nu good nutrition requires complex foods that meet the body's needs for the following. You need proteins, you need lipids, you need vitamins, you need minerals, and you need carbs. You need all those things, but you have to have them in moderation. Okay, too much of any of these is not good. Too much protein is not good. Too much lipid is not good. Too much carbs is not good. Too much vitamin. There are certain vitamins 
that if you have too much, okay, it can cause problems. And we'll talk about that. Okay, the fuel. Okay, substance solely or primary ox oxidized to extract energy is called ATP. That's our fuel. Okay, and it's called adenosine A tri T P phosphate. Adenosine triphosphate. And ATP is made during a process called cellular reproduction. Okay, this is not mitosis, right? That's um, that's asexual reproduction. This is not, you know, the gamete formation like meiosis. That's not any of that. It's cellular, right? Um, I'm sorry, not cellular reproduction, cellular respiration. Look at me saying the wrong thing. Cellular respiration. Okay, cellular respiration. Okay. Nutrients. Okay, let's talk about some nutrients that we actually intake. Okay, any ingested chemical used for growth, repair, or maintenance. Okay, there are six classes of nutrients. There's water, carbs, lipids, proteins. Okay. Um, and then you have vitamins and minerals, right? Water, carbs, lipids, proteins, vitamins, minerals. Those are my six classes of nutrients. Okay. You have macronutrients, which you must consume in large quantities. That's why they're called macro. You have to consume them in large quantities. Okay. And those are going to be water, carbs, lipids, and proteins. Those four things are macro nutrients. You must eat these in large quantities. And then you have micronutrients, which are your vitamins and your minerals. Okay, these are micronutrients. You only need small quantities of these. Okay. Now, people who have multivitamins, okay, uh, the only people that actually need a multivitamin are old, old people, okay, older people who cannot uh, or do not uh, exercise very much or um, they're just um, getting, get, the older you get, the less uh, you can, you know, metabolize these things and the more you need to take them in in your, in your uh, supplements. Um, when you're young, okay, and you're healthy, you really don't need these. So the only people that really need to take a multivitamin are going to be very, very young people like babies, infants, and older people. Okay, people in the middle really don't need to take uh, multivitamins unless you have some type of deficiency. Okay, most um, young people between the ages of, you know, like, like 10 and, and 40, are getting all the vitamins and minerals that they need from their diet. Okay. If you're not getting, if you have a terrible diet, then yes, I would definitely take a multivitamin. Okay. But if you have a normal, healthy diet, you should be fine. Okay. A well-nourished body has about 440 grams of carbohydrates daily. Okay. 325 grams of muscle glycogen, uh, 90 to 100 grams of liver glycogen, 50, 15 to 20 grams of blood glucose. That's what those 440 grams are going to give to you. Okay. Out of those 440 grams, 325 of it is going to go to your muscles. Okay. 90 to 100 grams is going to go to your liver. Okay. And the rest is going to go to your blood glucose. Okay. So that's what you need on a daily basis as far as carbs go. Okay. So let's talk more about carbs. Carbs are sugars, okay? Your carbohydrates are sugars, and sugars come in many different forms. Uh, sugars can be structural components of other molecules. Um, when, we, when you take a look at DNA and RNA, that's what nucleic acids are, DNA, RNA. Okay, those are nucleic acids. They are structural, right? You have something called a ribose sugar in your DNA and RNA, okay? and this forms your double helix. Okay. A's, T's, G's, C's. These things are going to form your double helix of your DNA and your RNA. Okay, you have things called glycoproteins and glycolipids. These are sugars that are attached to proteins, sugars that are attached to fats. We talked about the, the energy that your body uses called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That has a sugar component to it. Okay. GTP, which is a guanine triphosphate, and CCAMP or CAMP, which is going to be um, an enzyme that's used in um, signal transduction pathways that allow for cells to communicate with each other. 
all of these have sugars as their structural components. Okay, most of the sugars that you eat are gonna serve as fuel, okay, serve as that ATP. That's the fuel that they serve as. Uh, most cells meet energy needs by a combination of carbohydrates and fats, okay? So most of your cells will get their energy from carbs and fats. Okay, neurons and erythrocytes, so, you know, your nerves and your red blood cells, right? That's what that is, red blood cells. Okay, neurons and erythro erythrocytes depend solely on carbohydrates, okay? They will not use lipids. They will not use um, proteins, okay? If someone is hypoglycemic, okay, hypoglycemic, that means they have a deficiency of blood glucose. That means they're not, they don't have enough blood glucose in their body, which typically means they're making too much insulin. Okay, that's the opposite of hyperglycemia, which is diabetes. Okay, Hypo, well, hypoglycemia is a type of diabetes, um, but it's not the one you typically know about. The one that you typically hear about is when it's hyperglycemic, okay, when you don't make enough insulin, which means your blood glucose is too high, which is the opposite of this. Okay. Um, hypoglycemia can cause nervous system disturbances, uh, such as weakness or dizziness. And that makes sense, right? If you are, um, if you don't have enough blood glucose, then that means your muscles aren't getting it. And if your muscles aren't getting it, no ATP is being produced because that's what glucose is used for. Glucose is used in your muscles to get energy. And if you're if you don't have any glucose to give to your muscles, then you're not going to make the energy, which is going to make you weak and dizzy. Okay, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it like that. Okay, carbohydrate intake influences metabolism of other nutrients. Okay, fats used as fuel when glucose and glycogen levels are low, right? So if you don't have a lot of glucose in your system, then you'll start to burn fats instead. You'll start to use fats as energy. That's the whole basis of no carb diets, which are like Adkins diet, South Beach diets, keto diets, all the diets that are out there that tell you don't eat carbohydrates. The reason they're telling you not to eat carbohydrates is because when carbohydrates are absent, fats are going to be used for energy, right? So you need to make ATP. That's the point of, of eating. That's why you eat. You eat to make ATP. Your body likes to use carbs to make ATP, but if carbs aren't there, your body just doesn't die. It finds something else to use, and when carbs aren't there, it's going to use fats. Therefore, if you stop eating carbs, you'll start using fats, and you'll lose weight. Okay, Your weight will go down. However, the second you, you introduce carbs again, okay, the weight goes back up. Okay. If you have too many carbohydrates, okay, if you excess, eat an excess of carbohydrates, your body doesn't get rid of them because your body doesn't know if you're going to eat for a couple of days. So your body converts carbs into fats, right? So if you don't have, if you don't eat carbs, your body uses fats. If you eat too many carbs, it gets turned into fat, okay? The, the best solution here is to do, make sure neither one of these things happens, okay? Don't cut out carbs totally because that's not good for you, okay? You might, you might be saying to yourself, why? Why is it not good for me? Because your body does not like to break down fats all the time, okay? Um, and if you're forcing it to do it constantly, uh, there's going to be there's gonna be issues with certain organ systems. You're going you're gonna to overwork certain organ systems uh, and you can harm certain organ systems. So you need carbs, okay? Your body craves carbs, you need some carbs. It has to be in moderation. Moderation. Okay, everything in moderation. Okay, so you have to eat, and you have to eat the right carbs. Okay, there are good carbs and there are bad carbs. Okay, um, you know, carbohydrates in a Snickers bar are bad. Okay, carbohydrates in whole wheat bread are good. Okay, so there are, there are good carbs and there are bad carbs, and you gotta, you gotta distinguish between the two. Okay, continuing with carbs, okay, requirements. Since carbohydrates are oxidized so rapidly, they are required in greater amounts than any other nutrient. So you might notice that if when you go out to a restaurant or um, when you even just cook for yourself at home, okay, your typical plate 
if you just have a, like a pie chart here, uh, no pun intended with pies, but if you have a, you know, a plate, okay, you should have, you know, half of your plate be carbs. Half of your plate should be carbs. The other half of your plate should be, you know, proteins, vitamins, fats, minerals. Okay, but more than more than half your plate, okay, or just about half your plate is going to be carbohydrates. Okay, RDA is recommended daily allowance. Okay, the recommended daily allowance is 130 grams of carbs. Okay, the brain alone uses 120 grams of carbs of glucose a day. Um, so you need to have 120 of carbs a day. So that was one of the organ systems I, I just mentioned that uh, could could get damaged by not eating carbs. Right? Your brain needs carbs to survive. So you want to you don't want to cut out carbs totally. Okay. Consumption, like I said earlier, a century ago, Americans consumed about four pounds of sugar a year. Okay, four pounds of sugar per year, a uh, uh, hundred years ago. Okay, and the reason for that is we didn't a hundred years ago they didn't use corn syrup and everything. Okay, corn is a starch, which is a very complex carbohydrate, and corn syrup is made from corn. So corn syrup is strictly carbs made of corn made from corn and it's in everything you eat nowadays okay every single thing you eat is going to have corn syrup in it and at some level okay nowadays the average person eats 60 pounds of sugar in a year okay and 46 pounds of corn syrup so you have over a hundred pounds of sugar in a year. That's the average American. Now I realized not so long ago when I started shopping at Costco, how much sugar I was consuming just in my coffee. Okay. So what I do is I stopped eating white sugar. Okay. So I stopped eating regular granulated white sugar. I started going to sugar in the raw because sugar in the raw is metabolized better. It's not as many calories and it doesn't, it doesn't affect you like white sugar does. So when I went to Costco, I bought a six pound bag. A six pound bag lasts me about a month and a half. Okay. Before I have to get another six pound bag. Now I only put this sugar into my coffee. I don't use this sugar to bake. I don't use this sugar to, to cook with. I strictly use this sugar in my coffee and I'm using six pounds and I'm the only one who drinks. I'm the only one who eats the sugar. No one else in my house eats the sugar. So me alone, just in my coffee, I'm eating six pounds of sugar every month and a half. So let's, let's just say two months, right? So in, in a year, I'm eating 36 pounds of sugar by myself in my coffee alone. 36 pounds of sugar is being ingested by me in just my coffee cups. 36 pounds. That's like a five-year-old, right? Like That's like the weight of a five-year-old, 36 pounds, okay? Could you imagine that? That's how, that's how much I, and, and I, it, it made me very upset to realize that. And that doesn't include any of the other things that I eat, right? I like ice cream every now and then, tons of sugar and ice cream. Okay. So how many, like, look at this, you know, a hundred years ago, people ate four pounds a year. I'm eating six pounds in, in a month and a half just in my coffee. Okay. So that, that should make you think a little bit. Check this out in a one, in one 12 ounce, um, non-diet soft drink. So 12 ounces of soda. Okay, 12 ounces is not very much. What's 12 ounces? Is that, is that a bottle of water? Is 12 ounces a bottle of water? Just about, right? Okay, 12 ounces is eight teaspoons of sugar. I'm not sure how many grams that is, okay, but it's a lot. Okay, eight teaspoons of sugar in one 12 ounce um, soft drink. I put one teaspoon into one cup of coffee, all right? So if I put one teaspoon into one cup of coffee, I, I, dr I drink a lot of coffee, but you know, that's a lot, right? I have one for, for a cup of coffee. You're having eight in one bottle of soda, which is insane. It's absolutely insane. Whoops. 
not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. Okay. Dietary carbs come in three principal forms. You have monosaccharides, which are whoops, which are things like glucose, galactose, and fructose. You have uh, they may arise from digestion of starts and disaccharides. Okay, so when you eat carbs and disaccharides, you break them down into these things. You break them down into monosaccharides. Mono means one, saccharide means sugar. Your small intestine and your liver will convert galactose, which is a type of monosaccharide, and fructose into glucose so that you can use that to make ATP. Ultimately, all carbs um, will generate glucose. All these carbohydrates will eventually get broken down into glucose because that's the thing you need to make ATP. And your normal blood sugar level should be around 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. Disaccharides is the next um, form that a carb can take, and that's two simple sugars, right? So monosaccharide, these are one single simple sugars. If you take any of these three and you put them together, you make a disaccharide. Okay, so sucrose is a disaccharide. Maltose, lactose, these are all disaccharides. By taking two of these simple sugars and adding them together. Then you have polysaccharides, which is the third type. Okay, polysaccharides are uh, three or more um, simple sugars uh, connected together. And a starch, like bread, rice, potatoes, those are starches. Those are um, polysaccharides, complex carbs. Uh, glycogen, which is what your liver makes. Cellulose, which is what you find in plant walls, cell walls. Okay, these are all... Uh, polysaccharides. Okay, the glycemic index. Okay, the effect of dietary carbohydrates on blood glucose levels. High uh, glycemic index carbohydrates stimulate high insulin demand and raise the risk of obesity and type two diabetes. This is what it's, this is what dieting is all about, right here. This is it. When you try to diet. You have to cut out foods that have a high glycemic index. If you cut out foods that have high glycemic indexes, you will lose weight without even exercising. Okay. Exercise will a hundred percent help, but if you just stop eating things high in the glycemic index, then you will lose weight. Okay. That is things that are sugary and sweet, um, like high corn, like high fructose corn syrup. Um, don't eat that kind of stuff. Wine is very high. Alcohol in general is very high in glycemic index. Okay. You want to stay away from things that are high in glycemic index. Okay. White potatoes, right. Uh, are very high in glycemic index, but sweet potatoes are low in glycemic index. Okay. The easiest way to, to lose weight is to diet like you have diabetes, right? People who, are, who people who are diabetic have to have for fairly strict diets when it comes to glycemic index. So if you just follow a diabetics meal plan, you will lose weight. That is the healthiest meal plan you can you can go by is one that ha a diabetic has to uh, you know abide by. Okay. Nearly all dietary carbohydrates come from plants. Okay, Su sucrose uh, we get from sugarcane. Fructose uh, we get from fruits and corn syrup. Maltose uh, you get that in grains, okay, like wheat, okay, things like that. And lactose we find in milk. Notice every time you see OSE at the end of a word, it means it's a sugar, right? Glucose, sucrose, fructose, maltose, lactose, galactose, all these things. Anytime you see OSE, it's a uh, simple sugar. So let me plug in my good old computer here so we don't die. There we go. Okay. Fiber. Let's talk about fiber. Let's get away from carbohydrates. We're done talking about carbohydrates for now. Okay, fiber. Uh, all fibrous material that resists digest digestion is considered to be fiber. So cellulose, which is a sugar, but it, it can't be digested. Therefore, uh, we call it a, a type of fiber. Uh, pectin, gums, um, lingons. Okay, fiber is important 
to your diet is very, very important to your diet. Your recommended daily allowance is 25 grams a day for females, 38 grams a day for males. Um, you have water soluble fiber, uh, which is like something like pectin. You find pectin in oats and beans and peas, brown rice, not white rice. That's a very big uh, distinction there. Okay, brown rice is, and, and white rice is very different. Okay, brown rice doesn't taste nearly as good, but it's way better for you. Okay, you also find uh, fiber in fruits. Uh, fiber is going to decrease your blood cholesterol uh, and your LDL levels. LDLs are low density phospholipids and they are very bad fats. Bad fats. Okay, LDLs are bad. Okay. Um, water soluble fiber is going to absorb water in your intestines. It's going to soften your stool and increases uh, in its bulk, stretches your colon, stimulates peristalsis, which quickens the passage of feces, aka. What that sentence says is it makes you poop. Makes you poop. And that's a good thing. You want to poop as often as possible. Okay. Um, feces, when it builds up in your intestinal tract, you want to get it out as soon as possible because the longer it sits in your digestive system, the higher the risk of whatever is dangerous in your food getting absorbed into your body and causing changes. For example... If you uh, live in the South, like I do currently, um, people in the South like to eat a lot of barbecue that's smoked. And what you're doing when you cook things with smoke, you are filling those things with uh, carcinogens. Okay, when you burn wood, the smoke that comes off the wood is a carcinogen and you're making, you're cooking your meat with carcinogens. You're cooking your meat with cancer um, uh, products that could cause cancer. So you eat that. And then it sits in your digestive system for days. The longer it sits in your digestive system, the better opportunity that those carcinogens that you ate seep into your bloodstream, get into your cells, get into your DNA, and cause cancer. If you have a lot of fiber in your body, it will get rid of that, um, that feces in a much shorter time period. So instead of that, you know, those feces being in your body for, you know, a, a day or a day and a half, it might only be in there for five, six hours um, because of how much fiber you have in your diet. Okay. So the more you go to the bathroom, the better it is because it reduces your risk of um, intaking dangerous chemicals into your body. Okay. Uh, lipids. Lipids are diverse. They have a lot of diverse functions besides being an energy source. They are structural as well, just like uh, carbohydrates were structural. We find them in phospholipids. Phospholipids are going to be what uh, surrounds every single one of our cells. Every cell we have is surrounded by a phospholipid. And those phospholipids look like, like this. Okay. And if you could just imagine millions and millions and millions of these little things surrounding our cells, those are phospholipids. The little circle on the top is a phosphate. These are the lipid tails. Okay, that's why they're called phospholipids. And they're components of our cell membrane or our plasma membrane. Same thing, synonyms. They are chemical precursors. Okay, uh, cholesterol is a lipid. And almost all hormones and steroids are going to be made of cholesterol. So cholesterol is a lipid. And cholesterol is the base unit for all steroids and a lot of hormones. It's the basis for bile. It's the basis for vitamin D. Okay, so all these things are made with lipid structures. Uh, it's very important in the protective role and insulating role. So it's going to every, no matter how thin you are. Okay, even if we go back to that MRI of that, of that, of those two individuals, your organs, your internal organs are protected by a layer of fat. It doesn't matter how skinny you are. Um, you still have fat that surrounds your internal organs. And it, it's, it's almost like a bubble wrap for your organs, right? You put bubble wrap around, you know, um, a fragile uh, thing that you put in the mail or something like that to, to keep it from breaking. Same thing with your organs. Your organs are wrapped in, in lipids like bubble wrap to help them from uh, getting damaged. However, if you if you are obese and you are very very overweight, 
Okay, you're going to increase the amount of fat, which isn't good, right? It could it could kind of kind of strangle the organ, right? If you if you put too much um, fat around it, okay, so not good. Uh, there are things called fat soluble vitamins, which are E, D, E, and K. And what that means when something's fat soluble, it only dissolves in fats. Okay, and A, D, E, and K are all vitamins that dissolve in fats. So that's why you cannot cut fats out of your diet completely. Okay, that's one big, that's another type of fat diet where, you know, we talked earlier about cutting out carbs, not good. Also, you don't, you can't cut out fats completely. Okay, it's, it's almost impossible to do, but even if you tried, okay, and, and, what would happen is you would you would take or eat these vitamins and minerals in your diet and because you don't have any fat in your diet you wouldn't even absorb these so you would eat them but they would they would get uh removed from your body because you couldn't absorb them because you didn't have enough fat in your system to absorb them okay so the food that you're eating these with has to have fats in it in order for you to actually um absorb the, those nutrients Okay, fat should be less than whoops. Fat should be less than thirty-five percent of your caloric intake. Okay, so if you if you're eating you know a thousand calories, um, three hundred and fifty of those calories uh, should be le- should be you know, uh, fats or less than that should be fats. Okay, typical American gets forty to fifty percent of their calories from fats. Okay, that just goes to show why. America is is a little overweight compared to other countries. Uh, saturated fat and cholesterol should be limited to less than 10% of the fats uh, that you eat. Uh, you should have less than 10% of those in your diet. Okay, there are two types. There's saturated and unsaturated. Saturated is solid at room temperature. Okay, so like animal fats, like, you know, um, bacon fat, bacon grease. If you ever, if you ever, you know, cook bacon, you know, when you take it out of the fridge, there's like, you know, white streaks all over, right? So here's, you know, here's a strip of bacon. And then you'll have, you know, parts of, of red muscle. And then there'll be all this white stuff all around it. And that white stuff is going to be the, the animal fat or the, the body fat of the animal. And when you cook it, you know, you're basically, you're, you're melting the, the white fat. And that's why bacon shrinks so much. You know, bacon shrinks because you're getting rid of, all the fat and what you're left with is the red meat portion that's been cooked in its own fat. Okay. And then it's liquid in the pan, but if you left the pan on, on top of the uh, stove and let it cool off, it will re solidify and it will become like this plaque, this, this white, like almost like a paste. And that's why it's called saturated. It's called saturated because it, it stays solid at room temperature. There are unsaturated fats um, that are much healthier for you, like olive oil and avocado oil that stay liquids at room temperatures and those are called unsaturated fats okay Uh, most fatty acids synthesized by the body essential fatty acids must be consumed okay so there are some essential fatty acids that your body cannot make okay most fatty acids your body can make but the essential ones that you need to survive must be consumed in your diet Okay, where do we get these from? Okay, so saturated fats, these bad fats, these are bad fats. You want to you want to avoid saturated fats. Okay, um, you can find them in meat. You can find them in yolks of eggs. That's why people eat egg white omelets. Okay, I strictly eat egg whites to kind of stay away from the saturated fats. Um, dairy products, milk, or any you know yogurts, things like that have saturated fats in them. Uh, not not like the two percent or one percent milks. Those are going to have removed the saturated fats that's why it, that's why it's called one or two percent um because it's taking away percentages of the fats okay some coconut and palm oils have saturated fats depends on on which ones you get unsaturated fats these are the good ones we find these in nuts okay that's why nuts are, are healthy um healthy snack however they're high in calories, right? So it's like a double-edged sword. You want to eat healthy fats, but you don't want to eat too much healthy fats because they're very high in calories, right? So everything again, moderation. Okay, seeds, 
vegetable oils, okay, olive, corn oil. Again, corn oil, high calories, right? Where do we find cholesterol? We find cholesterol, again, in the egg yolks. Stay away from those yolks. Okay, cream, okay, like from milk. Shellfish have high cholesterol. Okay, so even though shellfish is good for you, shrimp especially, very, very high in cholesterol. Organ meats, okay, like um, liver, uh, things like that. Uh, other meats from an animal. And you get very tiny amounts of cholesterol in plants. Okay, so plants have way less cholesterol than meats do. Okay, let's take a look at proteins next. Proteins um, are about 12 to 15% of your total body mass. Okay, so a, bit, a good portion of your body is made of proteins. Okay, 65% of that 12 to 15% is skeletal muscle. Okay, so the majority of the of the protein you have, okay, 65% of the proteins that make up your body are part of your skeletal muscle. They have lots of different functions, proteins do. Proteins can have muscle contraction functions. They can have motility functions of cells, right? So like uh, the flagella is, um, is technically muscle fibers, okay, cilia on top of your cells is muscle fibers. Okay, so not just the movement of your body, but also the movement of your cells. Um, they are structural components. They are, they are receptors on your cell surface. They could be pumps. They could be ion channels for um, endo and exocytosis. Okay, um, they could be fibrous proteins that are going to be things like collagen in your skin, elastin in your skin, keratin in your skin. Okay, your bones uh, could be made of proteins. Not all the, your bones have a lot of calcium in them as well, but they're definitely uh, protein-filled areas. Your cartilage, tendons, ligaments are all going to be protein-based. Your skin, like I said before, your hair is protein-based. Your nails is protein-based. Okay, so many, many different parts of the body contain proteins as structural components and chemical components. Okay. Um, there are things called globular proteins. Uh, the globular proteins include antibodies. Okay, that's a big one. We talked about that in the immune system chapter and the lymphatic system as well. Uh, hormones. Okay, the hormones are going to be uh, protein and fats. Okay, lipids uh, are, are going to form hormones as well. Okay, myoglobin, which is going to help your blood. Uh, neuromodulators, hemoglobin, again, another blood component. Okay, and... You know, if that wasn't enough, there are about 2,000 different enzymes, which are proteins that cause uh, reactions to occur that control nearly every aspect of cellular metabolism, right? So every time, you know, A turns into B, okay, or B turns into C, there's an enzyme that does it. There's a little chemical called an enzyme that kind of uh, regulates chemical reactions. And every different, you know, every different reaction, C to D, has a different enzyme, okay? Uh, E to F, you know, I'm just making up things here. E to F has a different enzyme, right? So all these different reactions that need over 2,000 enzymes uh, are going to be made of proteins. Okay, you have plasma proteins. Okay, these are um, proteins found in your blood plasma. Albumins, okay, that's a, a, a protein that we said is found in very high levels in your blood plasma. Um, they, maintain, they maintain your blood viscosity and osmolarity, which is basically like the thickness of your blood, okay? You want your blood to be of a certain viscosity, okay? Um, it's going to help transport lipids and other plasma and other things that are found in the plasma, okay? So those proteins are important to your blood's thickness and viscosity and the way it moves around your body, okay? Um, the percentage of amino acids in a protein that the body uses Okay, so 70 to 90% of animal proteins um, get broken down into amino acids that your body uses. 40 to 70% of plant proteins get broken down into amino acids that your body uses. So you get more amino acids from meat and animal products than you do plants. Okay, 14 ounces of rice and beans provides the same amount of usable protein as a four ounce hamburger, right? So you, you can eat four ounces of cow meat, which is a hamburger, 
or you can eat uh, more than triple uh, of the amount of that hamburger in the form of rice and beans, and you will get the same amount of protein. You, that does not mean that the calories are the same, right? The calories in the hamburger might be more calories than the rice and beans. Um, the amount of cholesterol might be different. So just, you know, make, make sure you take that statistic with, um, you know, with the knowledge of that it, you know, it, it's good for protein amount, but it might be bad for amounts of other nutritional aspects. Okay. Advantages of decreasing meat and increasing plant intake. Okay. Now I am, I am not a vegan. I am not a vegetarian. I am a full fledged meat eater. However, you know, there are lots of, uh, studies that are occurring now that, sh that are telling you, and I don't know how good or bad they are. We will not know until, uh, more research is done on these particular diets, but it is said that, you know, there is a very big advantage to taking the meat out of your diet and, and replacing it with plant material. Okay. And the reasons for that are that you will get more vitamins. Whoops. I don't want to do that. You will get more vitamins out of eating plant material. You will get more minerals and fiber out of eating plant material. I 100% believe that. Okay. Um, the reason that cows, cows are eating the plants and we're eating the cows, right? So any vitamins, minerals, and fiber that we're getting from the cow, the cow got from the, the plant, from the plants, the grass, whatever it's eating. Um, the, the vitamins, minerals, and fiber that are the cows getting, they're coming from the grass, right? So we're not eating the grass, we're eating the meat. So we're not getting the full amount that the cow's getting. The cow is getting lots of vitamins and minerals and fiber. We're getting very minimal amounts by eating the cow. Okay. So it, it makes a lot of sense that eating plants instead of meats will increase your vitamins, minerals, and fiber amounts. So that's a good thing. Um, plants, like I said before, have almost no cholesterol. So the saturated fat levels are much lower. Okay. Saturated fat levels are much lower in plant materials. Um, like I said before, there's a lot less cholesterol and there's less pesticides. Okay. Um, forget that last one for now, because they're, they're kind of doing away with, with chemical, dangerous chemical pesticides. But here's the thing. And I don't want you guys to get, uh, lied to because, uh, that's what companies do. Companies lie to you so that they could, uh, make money off of you. So, if any company is out there trying to sell you some type of um, plant-based burger or, you know, uh, meatless buffalo wings or or something like that, um, don't just don't just buy into it because you know, everyone's telling you that plant-based stuff is better. In order to make something, in order to make beans or uh, cauliflower have the same consistency as meat you have to do things to that product that is not natural, right? So if you, if you have beans, it's very hard to just take beans in their natural state and form them into some type of patty for a hamburger, right? You have to, something has to be done to the bean or something has to, some type of chemical has to be added to the bean in order for it to take the patty shape in a bean burger, right? If you have a bean burger and you're, you're trying to make it taste like a hamburger, it's not just beans being, being pressed into a circle, right? It's beans and a thousand chemicals being added together and then pressed into a circle to make you think it tastes like a hamburger, right? So this is true if you just ate the beans, Right. If you just got a whole bunch of beans and boiled them in water and ate the beans, you'd have more vitamins and minerals. You'd have less saturated fat. You'd have no cholesterol and, and, and everything would be great. But all of these chemicals that they're adding is going to increase saturated fat, increase cholesterol. OK, so even though you're still getting more vitamins and minerals, calorie wise, this might be the same as the hamburger. Fat wise, it might be the same as the hamburger or not far off. Plus you're eating chemicals that you don't know what it's doing to you yet because we haven't, we haven't really had any long type of long-term study on it. 
So just beware, right? I'm, I'm not telling you not to be, not to eat this stuff, but I'm telling you to be careful of, of this stuff. Okay. That's all I'm saying. If you're going to do it, it, it would be in my scientific opinion that if you were going to go to a plant-based diet, that you eat actual plants. Okay. Don't eat plants formed into a fake chicken tender. Okay, don't eat plants that are, you know, pressed into some type of patty and made to taste like something else. If you're going to eat plants, eat plants. Okay, if you're going to if you're going to have beans, eat beans in their natural state. If you're going to have soy, have soy in its natural state. Don't go searching out these products that are, you know, copies of of meat products. Do it do it the right way. That's that's just my advice to you. Okay, minerals and vitamins. Okay, these are inorganic uh, minerals, especially are inorganic elements that plants extract from the soil or the water and introduce into the food web. Okay, so if it wasn't for um, the soil and the and the the dirt that the plants grow in, we would never get minerals into our diet. Okay, so the dirt has minerals. the The minerals get into the plants because the plants use the minerals to grow. All right, so here's here's a plant. The cow comes and eats the plant. The plant gets the minerals that are in the plant that the plant got from the soil. Okay, so this the minerals get into the plant, which get into you know the cow, and then we eat the cow. Humans eat the cow. Okay, and then we get the vitamins and minerals. It would be a lot easier for humans to eat the plants to get the vitamins and minerals. And we do. We do that, right? We eat, veg we eat uh, vegetables and, and, you know, things like that. We eat good stuff like that as well. It's not just meats all the time, right? We have carrots and corn and potatoes and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and all that good stuff. So we get our minerals as well, okay? But it's coming from the soil, okay? Vitamins are small dietary organic compounds that are necessary for metabolism, like vitamin A, B, C, D, E, K, okay, all those different vitamins, okay, neither of these are used as fuel, okay, minerals are not used as fuel, vitamins are not used as fuel, they are used for other types of meta metabolic pathways, okay. Minerals constitute about 4% of the body's mass, three quarters being calcium, Okay, so 75% of that 4%, okay, is calcium and phosphorus. And we find those in our teeth. We find it in our skeletal system. Uh, phosphorus is very, very important to us. It's, it's the P in all of these things, okay? So ATP, which is our energy, okay, is made of adenosine triphosphates. We need phosphates for that. Uh, C-CAMP uh, or, or CAMP. Um, is I said before, it's going to be that uh, signal transduction pathway. It's going to it's going to allow cellular communication. Okay, GTP. Uh, that's also going to help in chemical um, uh, communication between cells. Okay, creatine phosphate. These are going to be things for for our muscles and things like that. Phosphorus is very important. Okay, calcium, iron, magnesium, manganese all function as cofactors for enzymes. These are all going to be types of minerals that you find in the soil. Okay, so phosphorus is a type of mineral you find in the soil. All these things here are minerals that you find in the soil. And you'll see phosphorus amounts, calcium, iron, magnesium, manganese, all these on this, like the side of a, uh, a cereal box, right? Because cereal is a, a, a grain, and you, you get lots of minerals and vitamins from grains because they grow in the dirt because they're plants. Okay, iron is essential for uh, oxygen being carried on your blood cells. Okay, we need oxygen on our blood cells. If we don't have it, we can become anemic. Okay, chlorine is another uh, mineral found in the soil. Uh, is a component of your stomach acid, which is called HCl, hydrochloric acid. Uh, many mineral salts function as electrolytes. Okay, electrolytes are things like um, sodium chloride, um, potassium chloride. These are things that are going to help uh, regulate the content of the water distribution in our body, maintain blood volume. Okay, so if you are um, imbalanced in your electrolytes, that could lead to you know cramping, that could lead to passing out, okay, things like that. Uh, the best sources of minerals are your veggies. 
legumes, which are like types of nuts. Certain types of nuts are called legumes, like peanuts. Milk, you find minerals there. Eggs, okay, again, but but don't forget, eggs were high, like the egg yolk was high in cholesterol, high in, high in saturated fats, but it's a good source of minerals. So what do you do, right? You have it in moderation, okay? Don't eat eggs every single morning. Okay, because it's high in cholesterol, but eat eggs once a week or twice a week so that you can get your minerals and your vitamins from the egg yolk. Moderation. Okay. Fish, shellfish. Okay, again, high in cholesterol. Don't eat it all the time, but eat it every once in a while to get minerals. Okay, and some other meats. Animal tissues contain large amounts of salt. Okay, carnivores rarely lack salt in their diets. Okay, herbivores often supplement salt by ingesting salt from the soil. Okay, your recommended sodium intake is one and a half to 2.3 grams a day. And your typical American, again, doubles that. Okay, they double their recommend, recommended daily allowance of sodium to three and a half grams instead of one and a half grams. So it's more than double. 77% of the sodium that you intake uh, comes from packaged foods or foods that you find in restaurants because restaurants use tons of salt to flavor their foods. Okay, this could lead to hypertension, which is high blood pressure and potentially heart attack. Um, the first thing that someone who has high blood pressure will have to do is to cut out um, salt from their diets. Okay, my, my dad and my mom both have uh, high blood pressure. So they are told to stay away from salty foods, okay? Because salty foods will elevate your uh, heart rate. It is certainly uh, one of the things that contributes to underlying health conditions like heart attack, stroke, hypertension, things like that. Okay, vitamins. Okay, we should be nearing the end. Okay, uh, water-soluble water -soluble vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins. We're going to talk about the water ones first. Um, ones that are absorbed in water are called water-soluble ones, okay? Uh, they are absorbed in the small intestines and quickly excreted by the kidneys. They are not stored, okay? Vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin, okay? It promotes hemoglobin synthesis, collagen synthesis, Okay, it's an antioxidant, which means it's going to get rid of things called free radicals. That's what an antioxidant does. Free radicals are things that can get into your DNA and give you cancer. Okay, that's what a free radical is. It's, it's this chemical uh, structure that can get into your DNA, mess with the shape of your DNA, and cause mutations uh, in your proteins, which are cancerous. Okay, you have B vitamins. Okay, function as coenzymes or parts of coenzymes and molecules. Uh, they assist enzymes by transferring electrons from one metabolic reaction to another. That's a very important process in cellular respiration, making ATP. Okay, they make it possible for enzymes to catalyze these reactions. So, um, like I said before, like every chemical reaction you have, A going to B, C going to D, E going to F, all of these need an enzyme, right? Every one of these needed a different enzyme in order to work. Well, those enzymes need coenzymes, where's the word coenzyme? Every one of these enzymes needs a helper, a coenzyme to help that enzyme even do its job. So that's what that means. Fat soluble vitamins are incorporated into lipid uh, in the small intestine and absorbed in dietary lipids. Vitamin A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble vitamins. Okay, vitamin A is a component of visual pigments, helps your eyesight. Okay. Uh, vitamin D promotes calcium absorption. Okay. It's going to be uh, very important in bone function. Vitamin K uh, is going to help with your blood clotting or the ability to clot your blood. And vitamins A and E are going to be antioxidants. Okay. They're going to act as antioxidants. So it's good to have all these things in your diet. People that live in third world countries tend to have very bad eyesight because they lack vitamin A. Okay, so what uh, scientists are trying to do is they're trying to make um, grains like rice that people in third world countries are very heavily rely on. Um, they're trying to make species of rice that have lots of vitamin A in it so that the people in third world countries 
can have better eyesight because of the nutrients that are in their foods. Okay. Some uh, vitamin disorders. Okay. You can have hypervitaminosis. Okay. Which is an excess. Okay. Remember I said every, you don't want to have too many of these things, right? You don't want to have too many fat soluble vitamins. You want to have fat soluble vitamins in moderation, everything in moderation. Okay. Uh, so hypervitaminosis is an excess of fat soluble vitamins. Okay. If you have too much vitamin A, um, that may cause anorexia. That can cause nausea and vomiting, headaches, pain, fragility in your bones, hair loss, and large liver, and large spleen, birth defects, okay, uh, can be caused by taking megavitamins. Remember I told you only certain people need to take multivitamins, okay? Very, very young infants and toddlers who don't have uh, very good nutrition yet, and old people who also don't have good nutrition, plus they're just old, and when you're old, things stop working as good, so you need more uh, vitamins. Okay. So people that are in their, you know, younger years do not need these multivitamins because you can get an excess of vitamins. Okay. So that's if you have excess, um, fat soluble vitamins, if you have deficiencies in things like vitamin A, like I said before, you can have trouble with your eyesight. You can have night blindness. You can have dry skin and hair, um, and dry eyes. That's what conjunctiva is. That's your eyes conjunctivitis, right? That's pink eye. Uh, you can have a cloudy cornea, which is again, going to deal with blindness and, and vision. Um, you can have an increased incidence of infections because vitamin A is going to help um, your immune system. And it's the world's most common vitamin deficiency. Like I said, it, it occurs a lot in third world countries. Okay, carb metabolism. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is not a biochem course, but we, you could spend a month on this if you if you wanted to. Uh, most dietary carbs are burned as fuel within hours of absorption. And oxidative carbohydrate metabolism is called glucose catabolism. And this is glucose, C6H12O6, that's glucose. And when you combine glucose with oxygen, you're not really combining these things, but the way that this um, equation is written, it kind of gives that impression. Okay, so what you do is, what this is telling you is that you eat and you breathe to make ATP. You got to add the ATP onto the end of this to make energy. Okay, you eat and breathe to make energy. And that energy comes in the form of ATP. What do you make? You make carbon dioxide, which is exhaled. And you make water, which is used by the body. Okay. So you're eating and breathing to make ATP. You stop eating, you'll stop making ATP, and you'll die. Okay. If you stop breathing, you'll stop making ATP, and you'll die. Okay. So don't do that. Don't just stop eating and don't just stop breathing. Okay. There are three major pathways of glucose catabolism. The first, now this is called cellular respiration. Cell respiration. All right. This is the most biochem you're going to get from me today. Okay. The first step is called glycolysis. Glycolysis is when you take a glucose, glucose, and you split it in half. Glucose split. Okay, so glucose is a six carbon sugar. That's what six C means. And you split it into two, three carbon sugars. That's what happens in glycolysis. Okay, this happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay. Once, if now we're we're, talk, we're taking human anatomy, so we're, we're only going to talk about this in human um, aspects. Those three carbon compounds are called pyruvates, right? So you took you took a glucose and you cut it in half, right? So now you have these two smaller pieces, okay? That used to be this big piece. These two smaller pieces are called pyruvates. Those pyruvates are going to enter aerobic respiration if oxygen is present. If we have oxygen present, 
we're going to go to aerobic respiration. If we don't have oxygen present, we're going to go to something called anaerobic respiration, which is called fermentation, um, which is something totally different. Uh, and we're not going to talk about it. We're just going to talk about aerobic respiration. So because we are organisms that breathe and most of the time we have enough oxygen to do this. So these two pyruvates after glycolysis go to aerobic respiration. This is in the mitochondria. Okay. And what happens is that the pyruvates go into this thing called the Krebs cycle. It's in the mitochondria. And we use that to help us get energy later on in the process. Here is a picture of cellular respiration. Okay, this is the mitochondria, this big yellow, like bean looking thing. Okay, here's glycolysis. We're taking glucose, we break it in half. We get pyruvate. That pyruvate gives us a little bit of energy, but that pyruvate goes in here into the Krebs cycle. It goes around this Krebs cycle. It produces electrons. We get a little bit of energy again, but not much. Notice we're only getting two energies here and two energies here. It's not that much. But these electrons that are made during the Krebs cycle, they go into the last step of respiration, which is called the electron transport chain, which you guessed it, runs on electrons. So when we make electrons here in the Krebs cycle, all those electrons move over to this last part called the electron transport chain which is where we get lots and lots and lots of ATP. That's all of our energy. Okay, so we took one little tiny sugar, glucose, and we turned it into, you know, um, if you add them all up, you know, it, it turns it into like 30 to 35 ATPs. Okay, and that's good. One glucose gives us 35 units of energy for our cells. Okay. And just imagine if we're having grams and grams and grams and grams of glucose, you can imagine how many um, ATPs that you can make from one grain of glucose or multiple grains of glucose. Okay. ATP is quickly used after it's formed. So once it comes out of that electron transport chain, it's, it's used rather quickly. Uh, it is an energy transfer molecule, not an energy storage molecule. So you transfer energy with ATP. You don't store energy with it. Um, the body will convert extra glucose that you eat. So if you eat um, glucose that you don't use, your body will store it um, as what we call glycogen. Okay, Glycogen is very, very long chains of glucose, but it can also store it as fat. Okay, We can also convert carbohydrates into fat. Think of glycogen as like a, you know, like a chain. And these chain links are made of carbs or glucoses. And the thing that does this, okay, is your liver and it'll store this chain. And let's say you go on a diet or let's say you're sleeping and you don't have a lot of glucose in your blood. Your liver will go into this chain and it'll cut, it'll cut little portions off and it'll, and it'll use these glucose molecules to go through AT, to, to go through cellular respiration. Okay, glycogenesis is the production of glycogen, right? Genesis means the beginning of, right? If you, if you know your Bible, okay? Uh, Genesis is the beginning of something, right? And what is it beginning? It's the beginning of glycogen, okay? The production of glycogen. So it's synthesis of glycogen, okay? It's stimulated by insulin. So if you, if you produce insulin, that's going to help to make glycogen, and what is it? It's chains of glucose monomers. So these little these little rings are going to be put together to make glycogen. And it's storage. Okay, we're using we're doing it to store. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. The opposite of glycogenesis is glycanolysis. Okay, lysis means to break. Okay, lysis means to break apart. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Um, it's the opposite. We're not making glycogen, we're breaking it down. Okay, and like I said before, if you if you have too much glucose in your system, your body will combine them and store them in the liver as glycogen. But now let's say this is in the liver, it's been stored 
but you're on a diet or you're exercising really hard and your body's running low on glucose, your body will go into your liver and break this up so that it's no longer glycogen, it's now glucose, and those little glucose molecules can go to the mitochondria to make ATP, right? Glycogen couldn't go to the mitochondria, only glucose can go to the mitochondria, okay? So your liver cells can release glucose back into the blood, that's this, that's this glucose released back into the blood, uh, provides glucose between meals, right? So when, when you're sleeping, the time between your last meal and when you wake up, your body is going into your liver, taking glycogen and breaking it down into glucose so that your body can make ATP while you're sleeping so you don't die, okay? Gluconeogenesis, gluco means glucose, neo means new, genesis means to make, so it's the making of new glucose, okay? It's the synthesis of glucose from non-carbs, such as glycerol, which is part of a fat, and amino acids, okay? You can take amino acids and convert them into carbs or glucose, or you can take parts of lipids, a glycerol is a part of a lipid, and convert that into glucose as well. And why would you want to do that? Why would you want to synthesize glucose? ATP, okay? You need glucose to make ATP. Nothing else can make ATP, okay? Proteins don't make ATP. Complex carbs don't make ATP. Lipids don't make ATP. Glucose makes ATP. Not fructose, not sucrose, not galactose, not maltose. Glucose makes ATP. And we need ATP to live. If we don't make ATP, we die. Okay? This gluconeogenesis occurs in the liver, just like hydrolysis of glycogen and the production of glycogen occurs in the liver, but it can also occur in the kidneys. Lipolysis. Lipolysis is the breakdown of lipids. Okay, lysis, breakdown, lipolipid. A breakdown of fats for fuel. Okay, again, when we, when we don't have carbs, when we don't have glucose, right? So let's say, you know, we're... we're um, we're sleeping, right? And we wake up and uh, we're hungry during the night, but we're sleeping. Our body breaks these down into glucose molecules so that we can use them for uh, ATP. Let's say we get up and we jump right on a treadmill, okay? We have used all of the glucose molecules. The glucose molecules are gone, right? So now what do we do? We can't make ATP. What's going on? What do we do? We have to make ATP. Professor, I said, if I, if I don't make ATP, I die. Okay. So what we're going to do, your body will then go into wherever your um, lipids are being stored, probably in your adipose cells around your body, and it will break down the fat to make ATP. Okay. So when you have no carbs left and when you have eliminated your carbs, your body will then turn to your lipids. And again, that's the, that's the idea behind those fad diets where if you don't eat carbs, there are no carbs floating around in your system. There's no glucose around. So your body is going to be forced to use fats. Um, and then you're going to get thinner. Okay. Which is true. You will. They, they, they do work. Those fad diets, they, they work. Um, but it's not healthy. Okay? It's not the healthy way to do it. Okay, so let's talk about how and why what happens when amino acids or proteins get uh, broken down. Okay, so like I said, you don't want to have too many of anything. We want to have moderation. Okay, so we can break down carbs into simple sugars like glucose. We can break down lipids into glucose. Okay, when we break down uh, amino acids, you break amino acids up into something called urea. Okay. On one side of an amino acid is called a carboxylic group. On the other side of the um, amino acid is called an amine group, NH2. And that NH2 is removed when your body breaks down proteins and it makes it into ammonia which is very toxic to you and you're not allowed, you shouldn't have high amounts of ammonia in your system. So what your body does is it, is it takes the ammonia 
and it combines it with carbon dioxide to make urea. Okay, and what urea is, is urine. Okay, so your body will break this protein down and it will take this um, ammonia off of your, or it will take this amine group off of your per, uh, amino acid, which it converts into ammonia and you don't want ammonia in your system. So it will combine it with carbon dioxide and that's what makes your urine. That's what makes your, your pee, all right? Uh, there's a there's something called protein synthesis, which is the making of proteins, and it's a process that is required to have DNA, something called messenger RNA and transfer RNA. That's what the T and the M stand for. Transfer and messenger RNA. It requires something called a ribosome, which is an organelle that's going to read mRNA. mRNA is a message, right? It's a message from the nucleus. Okay. Um, protein synthesis is stimulated by horm by growth hormone, by thyroid hormone, and by insulin. All, all the production of all three of those things is going to cause protein synthesis to happen, right? Because to make a protein means it could be making an enzyme, it could be making an antibody, it could be making a whole bunch of different things. Um, there are essential amino acids and there are non-essential amino acids. Um, the non-essential amino acids can be made um, by the liver from other amino acids or citric acid cycle um, products. Citric acid cycle is the Krebs cycle, which is part of respiration. But then there are also some essential amino acids that you cannot make on your own, okay? And you have to eat them from your diet. And if you don't have them, Okay, then um, sometimes your your systems don't work as well. Okay, uh, your metabolism will change from outer hour to hour. It's not always it doesn't always stay the same. It depends on how long uh, the time is between your meals. Will depend on your metabolism. Um, about four hours during and after a meal is called the absorptive state or the fed state. This is when nutrients are being absorbed. This is when uh, nutrients may be used immediately to meet energy and other needs. Okay, so if you're eating uh, because you're hungry, most likely is you have some type of energy need. And as soon as you eat that food, the energy need is going to try to be filled. Okay, then you have the post absorptive state, which is where you're it's in between meals, right? It's, it, it's not necessarily fasting, right? But you're just you're just not eating during those times. So it's, it is considered fasting. Um, this prevails in the late morning, late afternoon and overnight. Okay. This is when typically when you feel hungry, right? Right. You, you feel hungry in the late morning. You feel hungry in the late afternoon overnight. If you were awake or as soon as you wake up, you're hungry. Okay. This is when your stomach and intestines are emptied. Um, and your body's energy needs needs are not met, uh, or, or being met by stored fuels. Right. So you're not getting the energy uh, from the stuff that you're intaking or ingesting. You're getting it from um, stuff that has been stored in your other organs. OK, like your liver. OK, uh, metabolic rate is the amount of energy liberated in the body in a given period of time. Right. So uh, how much energy your body produces and uses in a given time is called your metabolic rate. Some people use more energy than others, depending on their genetics, depending on their activity levels and things like that. Uh, you measure a metabolic rate with a calorimeter, which is a closed chamber filled with water. Uh, it absorbs heat given off by the body. It uh, measures indirectly with a, a spirometer by measuring the amount of oxygen in a person uh, that a person consumes. And your metabolic rate will depend on, again, how physically active you are, um, what your mental state is, what your absorptive and post-absorptive statuses are. The amount of thyroid hormone and other hormones that you produce will affect your metabolic rate. So that's a lot of people that say, I have glandular issues and that's why I'm heavy. They might not be lying, right? They might be producing hormones that are slowing down their metabolic rate 
or slowing down the amount of energy that they are using in a given time period, okay? Other people might have overactive metabolisms, right? They might have hormones that are causing metabolic rate to increase, okay, which would make them um, have to eat more because their body is going through these nutrients too quickly, okay? And that's it. That's going to be it for today. So if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. And if not, I will see you next lecture. Have a good night.